chapter 6. We have had a bit of a break from our series, and we pick it up again today in verse 7. We'll read from verse 1 so we understand the context. But from verse 7 up until chapter 8, verse 38, is a, is a whole new section in Mark. And one of the major themes here is both the identity of Christ and conflict because of that. And the passage we're going to look at this morning deals with believers who are sent out on mission in the midst of conflict, uh, but how they are to function on their mission. There's much here for us as a congregation. We begin reading in Mark chapter 6 and verse 1 down to verse 13. He went away from there and came to his hometown. So he's actually left Capernaum and he's gone to Nazareth. And his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if, if any place where you will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Our Father, we want to pause and pray and ask your blessing on the word that was just read and ask your blessing on the word that will now be expounded. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take these truths and drive them deep into our hearts, into our minds, and into our feet, into our hands, that we would leave here today Lord, more committed than ever to be on mission, to be on your mission, to be on this mission which is, which is possible. And we ask these things and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This isn't news, but the church for the last 50 years, at least in the so-called West, has really been struggling under what I'd call the curse of consumerism. That is, people who are professing believers in Christ, even members of a church, but they fail to see that actually they've been saved to serve. They fail to see that they've been saved to be on mission, to be on God's mission. And there's a lot of factors that go into that there's a lot of sad consequences that come from that. There are genuine Christians who do not mature in the faith because they're not on mission. There are some who do damage because they're not on mission, uh, at least not on God's mission, but they're on their, their own mission. Consumerism can destroy a church, whereas the biblical pattern is those that God saves, he expects for them to meaningfully contribute to the body of Christ. They're to meaningfully contribute to God's mission. And I say all that by way of introduction because what we have in verses 7 to 13 in Mark chapter 6 
is Jesus Christ now, for the first time, sending his disciples out on mission. You remember in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Jesus begins his ministry of proclaiming the gospel of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God. He's on mission. And then in verses, uh, verses six, verse 16, he calls Peter and his brother Andrew, and they're fishing, and he says, follow me, and I will make you to be fishers of men. He's saying, what you're doing now, I want you to change that, and I want to make you contributors to my mission. I want you to be on my mission. In chapter 3, in verses 14 to 15, Jesus, after praying all night, calls 12, the 12 disciples, to be with him, that he might send them out. They have now been with Jesus for quite some time. They have followed him. They have listened to him teach in the synagogues. They have heard him teach from a boat. They have seen him teach on the shore. They've listened to his words. They haven't always understood it, but they've listened. They've observed him casting out demons. They have observed, observed him healing people. They've observed his compassion his compassion as he's ministered to those who are suffering. And now after telling them that they'll be fishers of men, and after them being with him and having some uh, lesson time with them, it's now time for them to have some practical experience. And so in verse 7, he calls the 12 and begins to send them out two by two. It's the beginning process. He's going to do this over and over. Jesus having given them exposure to himself having given them much explanation, now says to them, it is time for practical experience. It's time for some on-the-job training. So he sends them out on mission. The mission that he sends them out on, begins to send them out on here in verse 7, is a mission that will ultimately come together at the end of Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20, when Jesus then says to them, now I've made disciples of you, now you have a large assignment, go disciple all the nations. That's a huge assignment, isn't it? And yet it is a mission that is possible. And Jesus gives them little snippets of that possibility by sending them out on these various trips, there's a few of those, where he sends them out two by two to go and to proclaim the gospel, to cast out demons, to anoint the sick, and to heal them. The major thing he's trying to help these disciples understand is this mission, though it's going to mean a lot of conflict, is a mission that is indeed possible. What I want to do today as a brother in Christ and as a pastor is just kind of shepherd us as a congregation to be more and more committed to being on God's mission, his mission, which is possible. And it's possible because Jesus Christ, the one who gives the mission, is all-powerful. Uh, I believe that as we as believers would take encouragement from this passage in understanding of the conflict we'll face, if we remain faithful, then we can see God using us in a wonderful way in his great mission of making disciples at home and abroad. That there's great power for this mission. And I want to say this, that there's lots of books and being written about the purpose-driven life. But for a Christian, if we're not on God's mission, if we're not consumed with, in some way, building up the body of Christ so that, as a church, we will be more fruitful in the mission. If we're not doing that, we're missing our purpose. We're going to be frustrated. We're going to be discouraged. We're going to be bored. Most importantly, we're going to miss out on knowing God in a deeper way. These disciples will learn to trust Jesus Christ more and more as they go on mission. So will you and I. Just two major headings of this passage. Verses 7 to 11, we have Jesus giving a directive. It says here, he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. In the Greek, it's duo, duo. These are dynamic duos, as someone has said. He sends them out two by two, and he gives them authority over the unclean spirits. He gives them particular instructions about what they can take on their journey and what they cannot take. And he speaks to them, gives them directions about how they should handle those who reject their mission. The calling, 
Again, he calls them to salvation, chapter 1. He calls them to service in chapter 3. Now he's sending them out in service in this chapter. That is true for everyone who is a Christian. We are called to salvation, we are called to learn, and we are called to serve. But I want you to think about who it is that he is sending out. One commentator makes his observation. It's difficult to exaggerate the risk that Jesus took in sending his disciples out to teach and to heal. Because the impression created by Mark so far t falls well short of complimentary. When you look at the previous chapters, the disciples don't understand his teaching. They don't trust his will. They don't trust his power to protect them. They're not sensitive to his extraordinary perception. Yet these are the ones that are sent out to teach, to heal, and to exercise. When I consider who I am and that God is sending me out, I take great encouragement from this. Because I can relate to these disciples who in so many ways oftentimes I just, I don't get it. In so many ways, my faith is so weak, and yet these are the ones, and we are the ones, that Jesus Christ has sent us out on mission. But there's a context here that we have to really understand. The context here of sending them out is one of conflict. In the first six verses of Mark 6, what we have here is Jesus being rejected by his hometown. And this is really important, because Jesus is rejected by his own people. What does he do in verse 6? Well, he leaves them and he carries on the mission. He goes about the villages teaching. He's just been rejected by those who do not believe. He goes to the villages, but now he comes back to the disciples and says that I need to extend my ministry and I want to send you out. So there's conflict, verses 1 to 6. And we'll see this next Sunday, verses 14 to 29, there's conflict again. And he brings in what, what, what many people call a, a, a Markan sandwich. There's many of these in the book of Mark, where Mark will begin something, he'll conclude it here, but in between there's this, there's this meat of a sandwich that somehow connects the two parts, the two pieces of bread, if you will. And what you have here is a reminder to the disciples and a reminder to those who are reading Mark's gospel many, many years later that when we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, there is going to be conflict. There was conflict from Jesus' hometown and there was conflict from Herod. We will face conflict. We will face rejection on God's mission. And yet, we should be encouraged that even though there will be rejection, even though there will be conflict, the mission is possible. I had some interaction with some brothers this week about some matters of conflict. And I took great comfort from Nehemiah chapter 4 and Nehemiah chapter 6 where you read there that in the midst of conflict, as God's people were doing God's mission at that point, building a wall, that they just kept building the wall in spite of opposition. They just built the wall. It says because the people had a mind to work. They had a mind to work because they were pointed to the sovereign God. In fact, in each of those chapters, oftentimes you see Nehemiah and the people of God, they're praying. They're saying, God, we face conflict as we're doing your work, but our eyes are upon you and we know this mission is possible. In fact, in chapter 6, you had this wonderful phrase. It says, and in 52 days, the wall was built. And so there's conflict in the mission. And Mark, as he writes this years later, the, the, the church and the Roman Empire is undergoing opposition as they are seeking to obey Matthew 28, 19, and 20. They are in the midst of conflict, and Mark wants them to read this and realize that, 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 that Jesus faced conflict, and these, these, these early disciples faced conflict, and yet the mission is possible because God is powerful. Jesus, in the midst of this teaching them about, the, about mission, he, he appoints them, he sends them out two by two. Why did he do that? And what does that say to us? It's interesting that the book of Acts shows that the early church, when they sent people on a mission, they also did it in pairs. John the Baptist, when he sent out his disciples, he sent them out by pairs. Why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One of those was, is accountability. Um, there is, a, I remember doing um, 
uh, the wedding for Gareth and Carrie Franks many, many years ago, and they asked me if I would do it from Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to, to 12, where it talks about if two, if, if two walk alone. Um, I don't remember the sermon. It was 20 years ago. If two walk alone. Let me just look it up in the Bible. Um, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Two are better than one. Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs because he knew they needed the encouragement. Isn't it a wonderful thing? When you're, I remember years ago, uh, when I was in my home church in the United States, this was back in the early 1980s, and I was, um, went, went out, uh, we went out knocking on doors in the neighborhood, inviting people to church, looking for opportunities to share the gospel. And, uh, and, uh, and I knew a Christian by the name of Dave. He was a really dear brother. And he said, I'd like to learn how to do this. Will you take me? And I said, sure. And so, uh, and so we, 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 we went door to door. And, we, and, I, and I took the first few and I would, I would, I would introduce ourselves and I would tell them why, wh- where we're from, why we were there. And we were talking. After about three or four of those, Dave said, can I give it a try? And I said, sure. And so we, we go to the next door and he knocks and the person opens the door and Dave says, hi. Uh, my name is Dave, and this is Doug. And, and, and Doug. He just kind of fell apart, didn't know what to say. And so I stepped in there. If Dave had been by himself, he would have been horrified. But having somebody there could come alongside and kind of rescue the situation. Jesus knew this would be difficult, so he sends them in pairs. But it's not just that. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, as well as Numbers chapter 30, 35, you have this principle that every word must be established between two or three witnesses. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 13, Paul appeals to that principle. And so here you have people coming out, and they're making this astonishing claim as they go from town to town that Jesus Christ is king that Jesus Christ is Messiah. And that's a pretty radical, revolutionary message. And to have two of them go, what they're saying is, when the one person spoke, the other one's saying, that's true, and I'm here to testify to that. So there was a, a sense of authenticity, a sense of accountability that was uh, an important part of this, of this mission. God sends us out, and it's a great thing to be on mission together. We get prayer letters from, from churches, and basically what they're saying is, we've been sent out, but we want you to go with us in your prayers and pray for us and encourage us. We should never do ministry alone, and I've not been great at that, but I think it's so important that when we do ministry, we have somebody else with us to train them and also for the sense of mutual encouragement. But he sends them out, and he gives them authority over the unclean spirits. That word authority, there's a, there's a word that uh, sometimes translated authority that means raw power. That's not the word here. The word power here, the word authority here means the freedom to do. It means to be delegated, uh, a delegated influence, the, the right to do something. Jesus was practicing the, the, the rabbinical practice that to send someone out was the same as the rabbi himself going out. He was saying to the disciples, as you go out, you are representing me. So he sends them out with authority over the unclean spirits. Mark speaks of unclean spirits ten times in his gospel. It seems to be a major concern of his, and the reason for that is simply this. Mark is focusing on the fact that Jesus Christ is the king of the kingdom of God. And as he pointed out in chapter 3, in that, that, that scene where the Pharisees said that Jesus cast out demons by Beelzebub, And Jesus says, it doesn't make any sense. He said, a house divided cannot stand. And he goes on to teach them that the one casting out the demons is stronger. He's he's stronger than the strong man. Jesus 
gives them authority because as they go into the mission, they need to experience this power. They need to have a ministry that's going to have the authoritative blessing of God upon it. But now he does something here, and he gives them assurance in verse 8. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. Now, if you read Mark and Luke's account of this, and you put these together, what he's basically saying here by no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, uh, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics, Jesus is saying, I don't you take anything extra. You take with you on this journey that which is on your back and nothing more. He sends them, and basically what he's saying to them is you're going on a journey that is urgent, but you're also going on a journey where I will meet your needs. I will provide everything that you need for the mission. As someone has said, the minimum of provisions was meant to call out the maximum of faith. As these, these disciples leave from Jesus, they're going out with basically the clothes on their back, not even, not even an extra set of clothes. They're not taking any extra food or extra money. Well, how are they going to be cared for? We'll read verse 10. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. Now, Jesus was saying to these disciples, as he sends them on mission, I'm sending you with the the bare necessities. I remember speaking at a, a, a local school here many, many years ago at their assembly in the morning. And one of the teachers got up and said, now this morning as a school, we're going to sing our favorite hymn, the hymn, The Bare Necessities. <laughs> and I was thinking, be thou my vision, just as I am. I, I don't think I've ever seen that in the hymn book. You know that song, right? I won't sing it for you. But I thought about that this week, because when I was thinking about the bare necessities, um, there is a hymn in that truth. That there's a truth here that Jesus is saying to these, these brothers, keep that hymn in mind, the bare necessities, but even though you're going, and you, don't have, you only have enough for the day, I will take care of your tomorrow. You know, one of the greatest challenges for the mission to which Jesus Christ has called his church is that of provision. Because it costs money to spread the gospel. It costs a lot of money to spread the gospel. You know, last year when we talked about Ecclesia after Africa, and we needed to raise uh, quite a lot of money uh, in order for this ministry to take place, uh, I, uh, I was doing a lot of praying about that, as you were. And isn't it a wonderful thing that as Ecclesia Africa gets launched this month, we have all the provision we need. The Lord has provided. And Tommy had some contacts this week, and, and, and uh, brothers that God has used to come alongside, churches to come alongside to meet the need. What Jesus is saying here is, guys, I want you to learn to depend on me. I want you to understand this mission is so important to me that I'm not going to let it fail. But a part of the mission, you're calling people to repentance and faith. I want you to demonstrate faith. I want you to go out and be able to tell people, the Lord will meet my needs. Now, how did he meet their needs? We're going to see in a couple of weeks' time, from verses 30 following in this chapter, that Jesus does a miracle of the uh, feeding the, the, the thousands, 5,000. I was reading a book by Matt Chandler this week, and uh, he's a pastor in Texas. And he said that he has a friend who's just a very zealous evangelist. And he said they went into to a Subway restaurant recently, and when they went there, his, his friend said to the person at the counter, he said, he said, what's your biggest piece of bread here? And they showed him one of those pieces of bread about this big. And he said, do you think you could feed 5,000 people from that? And the guy said, what? And he used it as a sedgeway into the gospel. Well, normally... God's not feeding his people with those kind of miracles. He can't do that. But you know how God's going to care for these disciples? He's not going to, in a sense, create provision for them. He's simply going to lead them to places where he's already made provision. He's going to lead them to homes 
where people will show hospitality to them. That's what he's saying in verse 10. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. When you read the parallel passages, it's quite clear that you go, that you go to in those days, there was great hospitality in the ancient world. You would go there and say, here I am. I represent Jesus. I represent Messiah. I represent the King. And I've come here with a message. Will you take me in? And he said, there are people who will take you in. That's why you don't need all this extra baggage, because I will provide for you. How is it that God's mission then was funded? It was funded by others who also believed in God's mission. It was funded by those who took what God had already given to them and shared it with those who were on mission. That's what we do as a church. Every missions conference, every year, our World Outreach Celebration, we're asking the congregation, God has given to us provision. How much provision are we willing to lay aside to meet the needs of those who are going out to different places on mission? Christians concerned about Christians. And through that, the mission is funded. I remember... Uh, in the early 80s, I was driving home from university, uh, and there was a snowstorm about, about an hour into my trip. I had about an eight-hour drive to come home. And I had, a, I had an old 1970 Volkswagen uh, uh, Beetle. Remember Lena Daisel? It looked just like that. So for mine was different. When, when I drove my Volkswagen, I could see the road not only from the windscreen, but also from the floor. In fact, when we got married and then we had a child, Jill would not allow Allison's car seat to be in that car because she was afraid she'd look in the rearview mirror and it wouldn't be there any longer. And so I was driving home in this snowstorm and, 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 uh, and, and the roads became very, very icy, about three hours out and five hours still from home. And, and, I, and, and I, saw a rest, uh, I saw a hotel, a motel. And I pulled off, and when I went in there, I thought, I better, I better just, I'm never going to make it driving here tonight. The problem was I only had enough cash for, for, um, for petrol to get home, but I had a checkbook. And as I walked into the, uh, the lobby, I saw this big sign, no checks under any circumstances accepted. But I thought, I'll push my luck. And I said to this very kind lady behind the counter, I said, um, I'm on my way home. It was, I think it was Christmas, uh, day before Christmas Eve. I said, I'm on my way home. Uh, I'm at university down in uh, Chattanooga. And um, she said, what, do you, what university? And I told her. She said, what are you studying? I said, I'm studying to be a pastor. And she said, really? She said, I'm a Christian. And I thought, Phew. <laughs> And I said to her, I see your sign. I said, the truth is, I don't have enough cash to, to have a hotel room and to get home. But I do have a checkbook. And I can promise you there's enough funds in the check account to cover this. Will you take it? I remember, I remember what she said. She said, you know what? She said, if my son was stuck somewhere, I'd want someone to take care of him. She said, go ahead and write the check. So I wrote the check. It, it cleared. And spent the night. The next day, got home. But I was thinking about that this week. That What that lady was showing was, was really biblical hospitality. She was caring for the need of someone, and particularly someone who was, who was a Christian. How does God fund his mission? He funds his mission in various ways, but primarily through those who also buy into the mission, to those who also buy the need of Jesus Christ, and therefore they support him. And you read the book of Philippians, and, and Paul speaks there about the fact that um, um, the church at Philippi had sent over and over again to meet his need as he was on mission. And, and you just kind of see this principle in the New Testament. In, in Acts chapter 2, you have God's people bringing their provision together to help one another. You see that in Acts chapter 4. You see that in Acts chapter 11. You see that in Romans chapter 15 when Paul speaks about an offering that he is collecting to take to the saints in Jerusalem. You see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. Again, Philippians chapter 4, there's this principle here that if we're on mission together, someone must fund that. And God oftentimes usually funds it through providing provision beforehand. God and his providence. What I'm simply trying to say is this, is God has given to us everything we need for mission. Everything we need for mission. God has given to us. It's just a matter of us relocating that to those that God is sending out. So there's an assurance 
that God will provide everything we need for this mission. I had some emails this week from some brothers, one brother in a township. Uh, we mentioned we prayed for him last Sunday night. Uh, his uh, building had been completely vandalized. But he wrote and, and he said they found, a, uh, they found another venue. But they just needed some funds to help secure it. And meanwhile, they, he contacted Heart Cry Ministry. And Heart Cry Ministry has provided the funds. So uh, next Sunday, they'll have a venue. They'll have a place to meet. God meets the needs of those on mission. That should encourage us. We're not just talking here about a corporate thing. Would you keep this in mind, Christian? That yes, God will meet the needs of the congregation, the, 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 the corporate mission of the church, but as each of us are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we know that God will meet our needs. And that's particularly encouraging. We'll see something of like that tonight in James chapter 5, but God meets the needs of those on mission. But he also wants them to be aware of something. In verse 11, Jesus gives them the awareness of the conflict. In verse 11, and if in any place, and if any place will not receive you, that is, they will not show you hospitality. And they will not listen to you. When you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. This is repeated in the other Gospels. It was practiced by the Apostle Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 13, verse 51. It was practiced later by Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 18 and verse 6, where these very words are used. They went to a town. They went to a place. They were not received. They were not listened to. The message of the kingdom of the king was rejected, and they shook the dust off their feet. What does that mean? Well, understand, this was never commanded under the Old Covenant. But the, the Jewish nation, people in the Jewish nation, kind of enacted and adopted a practice that when they would travel outside of the so-called promised land, and they were now coming into Gentile territory, and now they're coming back into the Holy Land, before they crossed the border, at the border patrol, they would actually kick off the dust of their feet. You can't see me doing that. I'm doing that behind the pulpit. They would kick off the dust of their feet. Because what they're saying is that dust, that ground from Gentile territory is, is corrupt. It's polluted. And now I'm going back, we're going back in the holy land. We don't want to bring that corruption into this land. Now keep this in mind that the mission that Jesus is sending his disciples on is amongst, not Gentiles at this point, but amongst Jews. Are you with me? And what he's saying to them is, if you come to a Jewish person, no matter how orthodox they think they are, no matter how religious they are, if they reject me, then they are just like the pagans. Even though they live in the Holy Land, they're rejecting their Holy Lord. I want to, I, I, this is a point where we really need to concentrate and think this thing through. These brothers are being sent on mission to those that they are covenantally connected to fellow Jews. And there are those who they are covenantally connected to who are not connected to the Lord. Externally they are, but not internally. Not all Israel is of Israel. This would have been a, I think, a painful thing for these disciples to say, we must treat you like pagans. Even though you profess to belong to God, the fact that you're rejecting the word of Christ because you're not repenting, therefore, we must treat you like a pagan. Hold that thought. We'll come back to it in a moment. But it's very important we understand something here. When the disciples did this, 
This was actually an act of grace. Because this would have been such a wake, it could have been such a wake-up call to them. Saying, whoa, we're Jews. We have the covenant. We have the word of God. We have the ark. We have the temple. We have all of this. We've been chosen, and yet we're being treated, we're being rejected as pagans? I think when Jesus said this, there was great love behind the saying, you need to do all you can to wake them up to the seriousness of rejecting me. I think it was an action to demonstrate the seriousness of their spiritual condition that they might reconsider and believe. We have something similar to that today in the covenantal community of the local church. In fact, in chapter, Matthew, in chapter 18 of Matthew, what does Jesus say? If someone sins, if a brother sins, you go to them. And if they hear you, then great, you've gained your brother. If they do not hear you, then you take another. And if they do not hear, then you take it to the church. If they do not hear the church, let them be to you as what? Tax collector, as a sinner. In other words, as a pagan. There's a real sense in which as we're on mission as a church, sometimes we're facing this with our own congregations. There are people who are covenant, covenantally connected externally, but they're behaving like those who reject Christ. Why do we have the church discipline? We have the church discipline because God gave it to us because he loves his church. And he wants his church, all of them, to be on mission. This kind of severity, if you will, is used by God as a wake-up call that will reconsider our behavior and get in on God's mission. The disciples are being taught here to be aware that even those that professedly belong sometimes will oppose and reject and cause conflict. The disciples are being warned that the mission of God is not going to be easy. There's going to be conflict. We need to realize that. It's not an easy thing to share the gospel. It's not an easy thing to be on mission. There's opposition. And that comes back to now more and more we see why it's so important two by two. I sent out a an SMS, SOS this week to some brothers saying, pray for me. Pray for me. You know, when you're involved, sometimes there's conflict, right? You found that? And you need others to pray. We shouldn't be surprised by the conflict. I think Jesus also was saying here, a very important principle, that this mission is urgent. And you must be a good steward of your time and of your resources. He's saying, listen guys, if you go, and he's not saying this is some kind of a flippant thing, a person the first time doesn't understand and you just wipe, not saying that at all. What he is saying is this mission is urgent. Be a good steward of your time and of your resources. That's personally, by the way, why I think Matthew 18 is so important. That if you don't apply that principle of church discipline, what you end up doing is wasting so much time with people who don't want to do what is right. And that is why Jesus said, you practice this and you deal with it. You go through a process. And once you go through the process, if they continue to dig their heels in, then you must move on because you must invest your resources and time in those who will repent. Because what's the mark of a Christian? It's not a one-time repentance. It's a lifestyle of repentance. So the Lord directs them. He gives them assurance. He gives them awareness of what they might face. And then they, in verses 12 and 13, they depart and they do the mission. So they went out and they proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Their message was the same to be, uh, the same message as Jesus was in John chapter 1. 
Matthew, or Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. He goes out preaching the message of repentance. He says to the disciples, when you go out, proclaim. The word means herald that people should repent. What does repent mean? It means to have a change of mind. It means to have a change of heart. It means to have a change of way. It means to have a change of lifestyle because there's been a change of mind. But a change of mind about what? Well, fundamentally, it's about a change of mind about who is king. And that's their message here is, here is Jesus Christ. He is God's promised Messiah. He is God's king. You need to have a change of message about who is Lord. Who's king in your life? Who is calling the shots? That's the message we need to proclaim today. And if we don't proclaim that message, I would suggest to you that there's really little excitement about the gospel. In other words, if people don't understand that they have sinned against a holy God, that they're in rebellion against a holy God, that they are under the wrath of God, that they are under the condemnation of God, that they're going to find themselves facing eternal, everlasting condemnation. If they don't understand that, if that's not brought to their attention, then there's no real good news because there can only be good news if you understand the bad news, right? Jesus says, be faithful to preach the message of repentance. Repentance is not the gospel. The gospel is the good news of what God has done for repentant sinners through his Son. But no one can embrace that good news of Jesus Christ dying for our sins and being raised again for our justification until first of all we realize that we are sinners and we, and we have an about face and there's a change of mind that, and what we used to just call mistakes or we simply called humanity. Now we're saying that's rebellion against God. God, I've had a change of mind by your grace. I understand that that's sin and rebellion against you and so I'm turning to you and asking you for forgiveness through Jesus Christ as we... That's the message we must proclaim. Sadly, today, it seems that so much of Christianity is not, doesn't even deal with the matter of repentance, even, even in our, whether our evangelism or our discipleship. And I, I have opportunity in, in the months ahead to drive this point home more. But as Martin Luther said, the mark of a Christian is continual repentance. It's not a matter of, I signed a card, I went forward, I prayed a prayer, I repented that day, and that's it. If you truly repented on that day and received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, yes, you're a Christian, but the proof of that is constantly we're repenting because constantly we're sitting under the Word of God and, and, and it's brought before us our sin against the Holy God and we're saying, I don't want to grieve you. I want to repent of this. I want to change. I mean, if you're a Christian, you want to change, right? Right? Jesus says, preach, the people should repent. And as they do that, they are casting out many demons. They're anointing with oil many who are sick, and they heal them. Not only did they declare the gospel, verse 12, not only did they declare the need for repentance, they demonstrated the power of King Jesus. They also, like their master, were casting out demons. They anointed with oil, which I don't think was medicinal. I think anointing with oil showed great compassion to those who were sick. It gave them hope that God is present, and many of them were healed. I'm not suggesting that today every Christian is going to be used to cast out demons and to be used in the healing of people. God's, God does that. But I think there's a principle here that underlies all of this. And that is simply this, is that Christians, those on mission, are involved, they are compassionately involved with those they are ministering to in this world. They come alongside and in word and in deed, they're proclaiming King Jesus. They're proclaiming the gospel, but they're also saying that Jesus Christ, what he can do, he can do, he can transform comprehensively. This is not some social gospel, but the biblical gospel has social implications. I don't have time to develop all that now. But keep before, us, before you that what the disciples are doing is simply mimicking what Jesus did. Everything. He preached repentance. They preached repentance. He cast out demons. They cast out demons. He anointed with oil and healed. They anointed with oil and God healed through them. They were simply following their master. Here's the thing we need to take home from this. If as a congregation, 
We take seriously King Jesus. And we take seriously his mission. I suspect as we get involved, more and more, we're going to experience more and more of the power of God. As we minister to one another, as we minister to a lost and dying world, we'll see God doing some phenomenal things. Because we got involved, because we had the compassion of our Christ. Just in closing, this passage, this passage highlights not only mission possible, but it highlights mission responsible. And here's what I mean by that. Every covenanted member of this local church is to be on mission in some way. Let me say that again. Every covenanted member of the local church is to be on mission in some way. We're not all going to have the same gifts. And we're not going to have all the same opportunities. But we need to buy into this corporate mission and say, well, we're here and we're a part of the body and we're going we're to make our contribution to help this church to be all that it can so that it will be faithful in its declaration of the gospel, so it will be powerful in its demonstration of the gospel. That means that every member is a covenant, by the way, who is a covenant member, says, you know what? I'm going to be here at Family Bible Hour so I can be equipped, so I can know the Word of God, so I can better strengthen us as a church. That means that every member is expected will be here for our worship service. That means every covenant member will keep their promise and gather on a Sunday evening to pray with the body and for the, pro for the body because we are on mission together. Not just some of us, all of us. And to the degree that we pull away because for, for whatever reason, and I'm not talking about providentially hindered. I'm talking about conscious choice saying, I'm not coming. But as we gather together, and as we say, I'm going to be involved, and I'm going to get involved in people's lives, and I'm going to study God's Word with people, and I'm, going to, and I'm going to come alongside and counsel one another, and I'm going to build relationships, and I'm going to help one another in holiness. As we do that, we are strengthened on mission, and this mission is, is, becomes a mission that is possible because we have the power of our Savior that corporately we are looking to and trusting. May God do that. May God deliver us from any consumerism, and may we all be committed to contributing to what God wants us to contribute on his mission. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray for you to take what we've been exposed to by the ministry of the Holy Spirit and apply it to our hearts as a congregation. Lord, there's people in this room who need to repent. They need to repent of trying to go it alone and repent of consumerism. In some degree, we all do. So easy to be, make it all about us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to see the glory of your mission. May we see the glory of King Jesus having experienced his grace, being compelled to serve him. We pray, God, that you would help us in 2019 to be unified around the person of Christ and his mission, being strengthened to reach more and further than perhaps ever before. Thank you for the promise of your provision. And may we trust you for that this year. We ask you, God, to help those amongst us today who, this is confusing because they're, they're yet outside of Christ, we pray that you would, by your Spirit, 
Give them a heart to believe these things, a new heart. Grant them repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.